Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another weekly recap of our chronological reading through the Reese Chronological Bible. We're finished now with week number 33, and we're at the 20th of August in 2022. We began the week reading in the last section of the book of Ezekiel. Uh, we read last week of the completion of the captivity of Judah and being deported uh, for the final times to the land of Babylon and the Chaldeans and the Babylonians being the ruling uh, Gentile empire. And in our reading this week, we've gone from that particular time that Reese identified as between the years of 573 and 539 BC. And we're going to cover the last portion of the Babylonian captivity and the oncoming of the Medes and the Persians and the defeat of the Babylonians at the end of a 70-year uh, captivity of Judah to Babylon. But before we get to that point, uh, Reese takes us through chapters 40 through 48 of the book of Ezekiel. And I believe those chapters are prophetic and tremendous amounts of information that speak about the land of Israel and the inheritance of the tribes of Israel and the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, during the millennial kingdom when Jesus comes back, steps foot on the Mount of Olives, defeats his enemies, and then sets up his kingdom that the Bible teaches in Revelation chapter 20 will last on earth for 1,000 years. After that, there will be uh, another conflict that uh, God will put down. Then there will be the great white throne judgment and new heaven and new earth. And as another rabbit trail, there's uh, controversy over whether the new heaven and new earth will be completely new, created uh, from nothing. And this current one's being destroyed or if it's a refurbishing of the present earth and heavens and uh, that's a rabbit trail for another day but in chapter 40 through chapter 48 of Ezekiel uh, I enjoy reading through this there's going to be tremendous topological changes take place in Israel and especially in Jerusalem and especially in the area of the Temple Mount when Jesus comes back uh, we don't necessarily read about all those topological changes in this portion that we read this week, but we find them especially in Revelation and in some other areas. And we'll see the necessity of those topological changes by some of the things that we've looked at as we've read through these chapters in Ezekiel this past week. When we started, uh, we see that Christ is going to rule and reign over the universe from the throne of David in Jerusalem. That will be a fulfillment of what Gabriel told Mary when he came to tell her that she was going to give birth to the Messiah. He said that you will have a son by the Holy Spirit. You will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins and he will inherit the throne of his father David. And uh, so we see that this particular portion of Ezekiel is referring to that millennial time, I believe. And we read a whole lot of information about this temple that I believe the Lord will construct. And uh, it will not be the temple, I don't think, that was desecrated during the tribulation period by the Antichrist. And so this particular temple will be glorious and it's going to have some dimensions to it that are quite different than what we've seen uh, from the first two or three temples that we read about in Scripture. And that is the cause for the topological changes, I think, that take place. So we see that uh, the dimensions of the temple are given, as well as there are chambers for the priests and the various gates and the courtyard areas and so forth. But we came to a reading in uh, Ezekiel that gave the dimensions of the temple, the outer dimensions of the area that we 
we might in our mind consider something like a privacy fence going around it or some type of designation that that was the temple area that's separate from the land where the people will farm or live or whatever. And the outer dimensions, we read each of the four sides of the compound were 500 rods long. And in the old King James version, it says reeds instead of rods. There's some question about how long that is. Now, you may recall that uh, the Holy of Holies in the temple is a perfect cube, whether it was in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, or in Solomon's temple. Uh, it was a perfect cube. That was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And then the room outside that, the holy place, was kind of like a rectangle. It was twice as long as it was wide. And in that particular portion is where it was the lampstand, the table of showbread and the altar of incense. In this particular temple that will be different and much more glorious than the previous ones, it says that the outer dimensions of the compound, which would include the courtyard areas, is 500 uh, rods or 500 reeds squared. 500 rods or reeds long and 500 rods or reeds wide. So as I've tried to figure out how long that is and looking at study notes and commentary notes and looking online to see how long a rod is, when you first search that, you are given the answer that uh, there's 16 and a half feet in a rod. And I think that has to do with our modern rod measurement and not the rods or reeds that were used in biblical times. And so the best that I can come up with as far as the length of a rod or a reed in biblical times was somewhere between 10 and 11 feet long. So if there's 500 of those, uh, that means that it would be somewhere between 5,000 and 5,500 feet long and 5,000 to 5,500 feet wide. And we think about how many feet there are in a mile. That means this compound that goes around this temple that will be uh, here on uh, planet Earth in the city of Jerusalem during Jesus' 1,000-year reign will be a mile squared, roughly. That's quite amazing to me. When we got to chapter 43 of Ezekiel, we saw that the glory of the Lord came back into this temple. Ezekiel is the one that gave us the information of the glory of the Lord or the Shekinah glory leaving the temple. Uh, prior to the time of the Babylonian captivity. He said that he saw the glory of the Lord rise up above the temple, go out above the Eastern Gate, across the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives, and from there up into heaven. And when the temple was rebuilt, that we'll eventually be reading about in the next uh, few days or weeks after the Medo-Persian Empire takes over, and Cyrus allows the people to go back and to rebuild their temple. We don't ever, and sometimes it's referred to as Zerubbabel's temple. He's the man that will lead that first group of people back to the homeland. We don't ever read of the glory of the Lord entering that temple. Now it may have, but we don't read that in scripture. And we do read that this temple that is spoken about by Ezekiel that will be there during the millennium, will be inhabited by not only Jesus, but the glory of the Lord. And so he speaks about that. In chapter 45, he tells us about the instruction of dividing the land for the inheritance of the tribes and for the prince and for the city and the temple area. And what we discover when we look at the dimensions and the borders that we find in this section of Ezekiel's book, that the borders for Israel itself are enlarged and the borders for the inheritance for the tribes are enlarged and the city area is enlarged and certainly we've seen that the temple area itself will be enlarged if the whole compound is like a, a mile square. Well, 
the manner in the instruction of worship that takes place, we read about in chapter 46, or we did read about it this week. And in chapter 47, we read about a river flowing from the altar, from the temple toward the east, and it will end up flowing into what we know as the Dead Sea, and it will heal it. And we uh, saw that Ezekiel was given instruction to uh, go through this water. And so uh, the one that was giving him this object lesson and taking him on this uh, trip, uh, we assume was a spiritual or vision type thing, measured every thousand uh, cubits and he would test the water again to see how deep it was. It began ankle deep and then it came up to his knees after a thousand cubits and then another thousand cubits that came up to his waist and then another thousand cubits and it was so deep that he couldn't walk in it, he had to swim in it. And uh, on either side of this river that we might consider almost like a canal that goes east from the city of Jerusalem and finds its way to the Dead Sea, there are trees on either side of the banks of this river and we read that they give their fruit each month. Apparently, the fruit was uh, whatever kind of fruit it is. And these trees, uh, they bloom and they bear fruit and it becomes ripe every month. Well, the borders of the land were given in chapter 48. And we finally get to read in chapter 48, which is the last chapter of Ezekiel, the inheritance that's given to the tribes. And I always appreciate and look forward to reading that particular chapter, especially at the very beginning of it. And the reason is that Dan's name is given first. If you've read through the Bible and paid attention to the times when the 12 tribes' names are mentioned or written or given to us, that they're always a little bit different. And when we get to the book of Revelation in chapter number 7, and we're told that there will be 144,000 Jewish preacher boys that are sealed on their foreheads to do service as evangelists for the Lord throughout the, the, the whole world during the time of the tribulation period or Daniel's 70th week. When we read the 12 tribes that have 12,000 young men sealed from them, we notice that Dan's name is left out. And that may cause people to wonder why. We're not told exactly why. Some people speculate that it is because Dan's tribe was one of the first to lead the northern Israel group into, cap into uh, idolatry. We don't know if that's right or not. It, the Bible doesn't say. And it's sometimes dangerous for us to make statements about things that the Bible doesn't say specifically. But what I like about this chapter 48 is that when it begins to tell us of the various portions from north to south that the tribes will inherit, Dan's name is mentioned first. So his tribe is the only one left out of those that are sealed, but he's not left out and his tribe is not left out when it comes to being present in the millennial kingdom and receiving an inheritance during Daniel's 70th week. He's not forgotten. He's not lost. He has an eternal inheritance. I think that speaks to us about the eternal security of our salvation as well. Well, then we read about the gates of the city and that they were named after the 12 tribes. And here would be another uh, listing of the 12 tribes. And we see that on this city where the, the gates are, that there are four gates or three gates on the north and three on the east three on the west and three on the south. The north gates have the names of Reuben, Judah, and Levi. The east gates, we read, had the names of Joseph, Benjamin, and Dan. So we see his name again with one of the gates. On the south side, the gates were named Simeon and Issachar and Zebulun. And then on the west, the three gates had the names of Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. So, we concluded that portion of Ezekiel's book, chapters 40 through 48, that speak about worship and life uh, in the 1,000 year reign of Christ when he comes back 
and information about that millennial temple and the inheritance of the tribes. So then Reese took us back to chapter 29 uh, to cover a few more events uh, that happened. He wrote about Egypt and some of Egypt's allies being taken captive and defeated by the Babylonians. That included Ethiopia and Libya and Lydia. Remember that after Gedaliah, the appointed governor over uh, Jerusalem, had been slain, some of the remaining people were afraid of the Chaldeans and they wanted to go to Egypt. And Jeremiah told them, don't do that. God won't protect you there. They went anyway. And here we see even Ezekiel speaking about the fact that Babylon would also conquer, uh, conquer Egypt and all of their allies. So as we read through some of the uh, last times of the Babylonian captivity and just prior to that, Reese took us back to the fourth chapter of Daniel. Remember that we saw just a, a little bit of it, the first few verses of it uh, in last week's reading. And now we come to the rest of Daniel chapter four. That's that chapter that spoke about Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a tree out in the woods being cut down and a stump being left. And Daniel interpreted it for him and told him that he was that tree. And it represented that uh, God would humble him and that he would spend seven years away from his throne and out in the wilderness with a, what we would consider an insane mind. And there are particular names for that uh, condition that people have in their mind when they think they're some wild animal. And then at the end of that time, we read how that uh, in this chapter that God restored his sanity. He restored him even to his uh, kingship and he made testimony that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he wishes. And at that particular time, uh, he was given his sanity back and, and then placed back as a king over Babylon. And then eventually he died and we came to a couple of other kings in Babylon. And uh, Reese followed this up, this chapter four of Daniel with Psalm 67, which is a praise for God's ultimate victory and kingdom. And after that, we read Psalm 123 and 130 and 137 that are songs of praise to God. Then Daniel's vision in chapter eight came next, the ram and the he goat. One of the things that you may have recalled from our going through the book of Daniel, or maybe you're studying the book of Daniel on your own sometime, that the 12 chapters of Daniel are not given to us in uh, chronological order. And if we were to uh, follow them chronologically, and whenever I teach through the book of Daniel, that's the way I do it. I skip the, from various chapters so that I can take a chronological trip through the book of Daniel. And we would read the first four chapters, and then we would skip to chapter seven and eight, and then uh, back to chapter five, and then I think it's chapter uh, nine and then back to chapter six and then end up with chapters 10, 11 and 12. So Reese brought us to chapter number eight and it was a time when <clears throat> Daniel had a vision of a he goat, a ram and a he goat. And it was a prophecy that was very accurate and detailed about the Medo-Persian empire being defeated by the Grecian Empire and Alexander the Great. And when he wrote it, and what we read was prophetical because it hadn't happened yet. But today, in the day in which you and I live, when we read it, it's like reading history. In fact, accurate history, because it came true just as what Daniel prophesied. Well, then Reese took us to Isaiah and Jeremiah, speaking about the prophecy and destruction of Babylon. There are about three places in scripture that we can read about the destruction of Babylon. Uh, Isaiah chapters 13 and 14, uh, Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51, and then in the book of Revelation chapters 17 and 18. These particular chapters speak a near-term fulfillment of that, 
Revelation chapters 17 and 18 speak about a far time in the future fulfillment of that. But we read about the destruction of Babylon at the end of the 70 years prophesied captivity that Judah would spend there. And then the chronology that Reese gives to us brings us back to chapter 5 of Daniel. And chapter 5 of Daniel is that one where Belshazzar, who was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, was uh, the one who was throwing a big party, drunken party, for quite some time. And he's the one that saw the handwriting on the wall and about had a panic attack. And we read about that. We read about it in Daniel chapter 5. And Daniel came in and <clears throat> explained the, uh, the meaning of the writing of the, the hand upon the wall and basically told him that uh, your number is up. Uh, your kingdom has been numbered and it's been divided uh, to the Medes and the Persians. And we read that that night, uh, the Medo-Persian Empire defeated and took over the city of Babylon and uh, Belshazzar was put to death. And then we read a subheading in Reese's chronological Bible that said, Persia is the world power. Sometimes their empire is referred to as the Medo-Persian Empire, and sometimes it's just referred to as the Persian Empire. Uh, the Medes <coughs> were uh, the lesser of the two between the Medes and the Persians, and eventually the Persians uh, became the dominant one and was then referred to as the Persian Empire. And the dates that Reese put in his subheading went from 539 B.C. to 333 B.C., which would be, and we'll read about that later, of Alexander the Great and the Grecian army uh, defeating the Persian army. Well, we came to our reading about this man named Cyrus, King Cyrus. He is of interest at first because he's going to issue a decree for the captives to be able to return to their land. And he's going to provide for them uh, the resources to rebuild the temple. And we read through a portion <clears throat> of Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 28 especially, where we discovered that Isaiah was given the prophecy about Cyrus and even his name somewhere between 150 and 200 years before Cyrus was even born. And then he was shown these things, uh, possibly by Daniel. And in Isaiah 44, 28, which uh, again was over 100 years, 150 or more years before Cyrus was even born, it said, Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. So then Reese took us to Daniel chapter 9. And the famous prayer and prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. And we don't have the time to do chapter 9 of Daniel justice, whether it's today or next week or any time in one sitting. It's one of the most tremendous chapters in all of the scripture, in my opinion, Daniel chapter 9 and verses 24 through 27 has the greatest uh, verses of prophecy that we find in the Bible. But that's just my opinion. And, but it is a tremendous uh, chapter. And so Daniel chapter 9 begins with Daniel fasting and praying. And it's going to last for 21 days. And what brought it about was that he had read from what Jeremiah wrote that there would be 70 years of captivity and after that the Babylonians would be defeated and judged and the people allowed to go home. And when he realized that the 70 year captivity was just right at the close of being uh, coming to an end, uh, he began to pray. And we normally think of Daniel chapter 9 as that great prophetic chapter. And the prophecy in Daniel 9 just goes from verses 24 through 27. But what we discover at the beginning of that chapter was a beautiful prayer that Daniel offered in the first 19 verses of that chapter. It shows us what a man of prayer he was. And in fact, later on in next week's reading, we'll see that him having a conviction to be a man of prayer will land him in the lion's den. But we normally 
pass over and don't think about the prayer that he prayed in the first portion of Daniel chapter 9, but it is a tremendous thing. And then we came to this great prophecy in verses 24 through 27 that covered the time from that point in time to the day in which you and I live and beyond the day in which you and I live all the way up until the time when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom. It covers that period of time that was represented by Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the four world empires that would rule the world until the ancient of days comes and the Messiah sets up his kingdom that will never end. Well, this particular prophecy is often referred to as Daniel's 70 week prophecy. And we discover as we read through this that this time period that's is 70 weeks of seven or 70 sevens represent a 490 year period each week representing a seven year period. And so these 70 weeks are divided into three sections. The first one is a seven week section, which would be 49 years. The second section is a 62 week section, which would be 434 years. And the last is a one week section, which would be seven years. And the specific prophecy about this was that there would be a particular time when the time clock started to the countdown of these 490 years or these 70 weeks of years. And that was started by the decree for the people to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And I don't personally believe that that was done by Cyrus when he allowed for them to go back and rebuild his temple. I believe that when we come to the book of Nehemiah, chapter number two, the first eight verses will cover when Artaxerxes gave the commission to Nehemiah to go back and to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And in my opinion, that is when this particular time clock begins. And that might be a little bit different than the way Reese gave us the interpretation of it. But we see that at the end of that second period, there was a seven week period and a 62 week period, which totals 69 weeks. And at the end of that period, the Messiah would be cut off. And I believe that that is referring to when Jesus was crucified at his first coming. And then verse 26 of Daniel chapter nine gives us the indication that there is a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week of his prophecy. What he did not understand and what nobody in the Old Testament understood and what even the people in the gospel accounts up until the time of Pentecost didn't understand is that that gap has now lasted right at 2000 years and it, incur it includes the time in which you and I are now living. And that one last week, Daniel, Daniel's 70th week, then includes the seven years that we refer to as the seven years of tribulation. So tremendous uh, prophecy that's given. And uh, we find here in uh, a portion of the scripture that Reese took us to at the end of the week uh, that came from uh, the book of Psalm, Psalm 102, a messianic Psalm that I want to read verses 25 through 27 of that. I apologize for the clocks. I think that means I'm talking too long. Verse 25 of Psalm 102. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years have no end. And so those particular verses we find quoted by the writer of Hebrews in the first chapter of Hebrews, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this Messianic Psalm 102 also was referring to the Messiah. Well, next week we'll go farther into our study and our chronological reading and we'll see what we find for next week and we'll have another recap a week from today. Father, thank you again for those who join us online. We ask for your blessings on them. 
Thank you for your word and the promises we find in it. Uh, thank you so much for uh, loving us and providing for our needs. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Until next week, uh, hope that uh, you have a great Lord's Day tomorrow and enjoy visiting with other believers. Until then, Lord bless you.